Well, today begins now with uh, the man believed to be responsible for the murder of 14-year-old Daniel Andrewing in northeast London on Tuesday, being identified as 36-year-old Marcus Arjuni Monzo. Monzo has appeared at the Westminster Magistrates Court today over the attack in Hainault. Monzo has also been charged with two counts of attempted murder, two counts of causing grievous bodily harm, aggravated burglary and possession of bladed article. In court today, he spoke slowly to give his name and will next appear at the Old Bailey on May 7th. Daniel Andrewing, the victim from the stabbing, suffered fatal stab wounds and four other people, including two police officers, were injured. His school, Bancroft's, has described the student as a true scholar who had a positive nature and gentle character. They also described him as a core member of the community, saying in a letter to his parents, losing such a young pupil is something we will always struggle to come to terms with and... All we can do for now is to look after one another and respect the privacy of Daniel's family. It's a time of profound grief and as a community, we will endure best if we come together in kindness and compassion. Daniel's demise has been profoundly felt here in Nigeria. The chairman, Nigerians and Diaspora Commission, Mrs. Abike Dabari Erewa, described the incident leading to his death as very unfortunate, sad and gruesome. She condoled with Daniel's family and remains optimistic. Drastic measures will be used to make sure the culprit is punished accordingly. Meanwhile, more than £20,000 has been raised for Daniel's family uh, through a GoFundMe, which was launched by Kwasi Asare, a friend of Daniel's brother. The page launched on Wednesday night and has raised more than £20,000 by 10.30 a.m. local time today. Our correspondent in London, Juliana Olaika, was at the Westminster Magistrates Court earlier. She sent this in. Hours ago, a 36-year-old man who has been named by the police as Marcus Monzo appeared here at Westminster Magistrates Court, charged with the murder of 14-year-old British Nigerian schoolboy Daniel Anjorin, who was killed on his way to school on Tuesday morning. Now, what we do know is that the 36-year-old lived in the London borough of Newham, which is just a stone's throw away from where the incident happened, and he is a dual national Spanish Brazilian. He spoke very briefly during his appearance today and only spoke to confirm his name. Now, the police have been very shortcoming in terms of the details of what happened on Tuesday morning in Greater London, but we did get some further details of the tragic incident. It's alleged that Monzo crashed a van into a fence in Lang Close just before 7 a.m. on Tuesday, hitting a member of the public. The court was further told that he then got out of the van and said he would kill that man and slashed him to the neck. Within 15 minutes, Monzo broke into a property uh, where a couple were asleep with their four-year-old child. The gentleman in the house received severe slashes to his neck and to his body. It is then thought that Monzo tracked down Anjorin, who was on his way to school, slashing him and then stabbing him fatally while he was on the ground. Well, as to be expected, this tragic incident has absolutely shot the Nigerian community, who are all too familiar with the tragedy of knife crime, not just in the British capital, but across communities in England and in Wales. Chief Magistrate Paul Godspring remanded Monzo in custody to appear at the Old Bailey next Tuesday if a court date is not available this week. Juliana Olayinka, reporting for Channels Television News at Westminster Magistrates Court. Really sad events in another development. Now millions of people in England and Wales have been voting today in local elections. There are elections in 107 councils across England and 11 mayoral races. 37 police and crime commissioners are expected to be elected across England and Wales. A by-election will elect a new Blackpool South MP following the resignation of former Conservative Scott Benton. Counting begins after the polls close at 10 p.m. local time today with the results, the first results expected after midnight 
on Friday, May 3rd. The U.S. has accused Russia of deploying chemical weapons as a method of warfare in Ukraine in violation of international laws banning their use. State Department officials said Russia used the choking agent chloropicin in to win battlefield gains over Ukraine. The allegations which U.S. officials said were not an isolated incident would contravene the chemical weapons contravention convention which Russia signed. The Kremlin rejected the accusations, calling them baseless. Spokesperson Dmitry Peskyov told reporters in Moscow Russia stood by its obligations under the CWC, which prohibits states from developing or acquiring new weapons. Some 193 states have ratified the convention. Staying here, but away from the Russian invasion of Ukraine, riot police in Georgia have fired tear gas and water cannons to disperse crowds for a second night as protests continued against a proposed law denounced by opponents as Russian-inspired. A number of people have been hurt during the protests after Parliament approved the second reading of the controversial foreign agent bill on Wednesday. The EU warns it could harm Tbilisi's ambitions of joining the bloc. The European Commission had said, had said that she was watching events with great concern. Ursula von der Leyen posted on X, the Georgian people want a European future for their country. Georgia is at crossroads. It should stay the course on the road to Europe. The governing Georgian Dream Party argues the bill will boost transparency of foreign funding, but protesters fear it could be used to crush critical voices ahead of parliamentary elections later this year. Now, International May Day was anything but a celebration for workers uh, across the world. On Wednesday, protests erupt, erupted in parts of the world. We're looking at the French capital, Paris. Thousands of protesters take into the streets to march and also take part in massive demonstrations staged by unions demanding better working conditions and social services. Several protesters, allegedly black bloc members wearing black clothes and masks, were seen breaking shop windows and leaving the scene. Wounded protesters covered in blood had been treated while a smoke bomb was thrown at riot police officers, which they deployed to the spot, who were deployed to the spot. Some protesters climbed on July Column, where they raised banners reading, We do not leave Paris in the hands of neo Nazis. They lighted flares. Protesters chanted, We're all anti fascists, and carried flags and banners during the rally. According to the police, 45 people were detained, 12 officers injured. The General Confederation of Labour reportedly stated that 200,000 people across France and 50,000 in the capital took part in demonstrations, while the Interior Ministry named 121,000 in total and 18,000 in Paris. Over in Germany, thousands took to the streets of Berlin demanding better working conditions. Protesters marched with trade union flags, signs and banners bearing low slogans. More than 20 demonstrations have reportedly been registered in Berlin, including two large right-wing and left-wing annual rallies. As many as 5,500 police officers were deployed in the German capital, as well as water cannons, a helicopter, and armored vehicles in the Kroosberg and Nyokolin districts where large demonstrations were expected. Crossing over to Manila in the Philippines, thousands of workers and labor union activists marched to demand higher wages and withdrawal of U.S. forces from the region. Protesters, however, clashed with police and beat an effigy of President Bongbong Marcos. Protesters also marched towards the U.S. Embassy amid fears an increased military presence in the area could lead to war with China. At least five people were detained by the police for acts of vandalism in connection with the rally. A last May Day story ends uh, in uh, the Argentinian capital, Buenos Aires, where thousands of workers took to the streets to demonstrate against President Javier Millet's government's austerity measures. The demonstrators marched through the streets holding white and blue flags, flat cards and big banners. 
Participants were seen drumming, playing instruments and singing, while law enforcement officers were seen patrolling the area. As some workers said, his government felt like a dictatorship. The cost of medication has been outrageous, they say, claiming he's allowed to is allowing labs to charge what they want. Demonstrations also were against uh, the administration across all of Argentina. Citizens opposing Malay's decree of necessity and urgency, which includes hundreds of measures to deregulate the economy, restructure the labor market, and introduce privatization. The omnibus law also grants emergency powers across a range of sectors. The government argues the reforms are essential to address the ongoing economic reforms engulfing the country. The world is in search of renewable energy sources, especially for developing economies like Nigeria. Therefore, the need for effective energy storage solutions is becoming increasingly paramount for many Nigerians. With the current power situation in the country, with just a few areas experiencing 24 hours of power supply, what's the common man to do? But still, what can we do to ensure efficient and renewable energy supply? I guess the man with the answers today is Damola Omole, Director of Scalable Solutions at the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet focusing on indispensable role of battery energy storage systems in advancing the energy transition. Damola, welcome to the world today. Thank you for having me. And it's great to have you here. Um, how about you beginning with explaining to Nigerians what BES, which is the uh, battery energy storage systems, what it's all about? Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I think... Uh, you know, as you mentioned at the at the top of the um, intro, renewable energy systems um, are really the future. Um, they they're required for a just energy transition. Um, battery energy energy storage systems feature in that equation by enabling renewable energy sources like solar and wind to come online. Um, so to put it uh, simply. Um, the sun shines maybe 12 hours a day and the wind blows unpredictably. Um, therefore, you need some sort of technology that allows you to provide energy when the sun is not shining and when the wind is not blowing. That's where storage systems come into play. And battery energy storage systems, or BES, is one of those. So how does BES work? How do we... How do we you know, transmit that energy from the sun and from the wind into homes and industries. Great. Um, so similar to, you know, the batteries we have in our remote controls or in our cell phones, um, where we charge our phones uh, either overnight and then use it for an extended period of the day. And as many um, Nigerians know, if you're not near a power source towards the end of the day, you're scrambling around looking for uh, to recharge your phone. It's the same thing with battery energy storage systems. Um, we're now just thinking at the utility scale um, on the order of you know 10 and 100 uh, megawatts, which is uh, several times more than what you have in your phone. Uh, so it works by um, the technology, uh, battery energy storage systems work by charging, by storing energy when the sun is out and you know, uh, you're using essentially the free resource uh, from the sun. You can use it to power, you know, your our everyday lives during the day and then use the excess to charge the battery so that at night when the sun is not shining, you then draw from that battery similar to your, using your cell phone um, off charge. Yeah, I'm wondering how this would work, you know, because we are entering the rainy season when sunlight um, will be, provision of sunlight will be limited in many parts of the country, how would it still work? Um, so, yes, uh, yes, but um, I think uh, there's probably a bit of um, apprehension about solar that you've just described. Um, so technically, solar, solar doesn't need the sun to be fully out. As long as there is light, um, the solar will work. But yes, it doesn't produce as much energy as when the sun is bright and shiny. 
um, at the utility scale, you have a combination of resources that you're combining, which is why it's usually important to have a mix, a uh, diversity of resources in your energy generation mix. So you have the sun, you have the wind, you have hydro, um, and then you have traditional sources like you know your um, gas power generator and others that come together to form um, the, the energy provision or the power we see in our, in our homes. So as we're entering the rainy season, the solar will still work. Um, it will generate energy, it will store it in batteries that you can then dispatch later. Uh, it's just a question of how much solar um, do you have installed and how much energy do you need? I know many Nigerians are very interested in this because power generation or power distribution has been very low since the beginning of this year. And we don't even know how, we can't predict the days ahead. So people want to know how they can, you know, bring this into their homes. I mean, is, there a, is this a special system that works? Is it, is it installable? How is it installed and all of that? Yeah, thank, thank you. That's a, it's a great question because um, what we've seen over the last 10 to 15 years in both um, variable renewable sources like solar and wind is a dramatic um, decrease in cost, um, specifically in solar. Over you know over the last decade, we saw a 90% reduction in cost. Um, that same effect we're now seeing in battery energy storage systems. Now um, there are two there. We, we can think of battery energy storage systems on two scales. You have uh, what you might call um, but utility scale, which, as I mentioned earlier, is on yeah. the order of tens of uh, megawatts. And then you have smaller battery systems that come with your inverter at homes, which, um, for all intents and purposes, are what we call distributed renewable energy sources. Um, and along those two, uh, essentially, technology um, options, uh, GAP, or the Global Energy Alliance, is putting in quite a lot of effort along with partners to bring to ensure the widespread adoption of this technology because they are the key to essentially unlocking these renewables we're talking about it sounds like you're saying you know we should the alternative to our normal power supply which is um, uh, those of us who are connected to the grid waiting on power distribution from the national grid is um inverters and these battery um, powered systems that that's what you're saying because it's renewable energy and because it is sustainable right absolutely absolutely so um <laughs> it's a bit of a paradox because in nigeria we're actually ahead of the curve not by choice i might say mm -hmm. um the world is moving to a distributed utility system right so the traditional um large central generating stations distributing power over um, you know hundreds and thousands of kilometers which was what we've seen over the last hundred years has started to evolve um, by hook or by crook because we didn't get it right in Nigeria which is why we have such high um, uh, high occurrence of load shedding um, as you described is that we have the opportunity to essentially leapfrog that technology which the rest of the world is moving to. So um, in an ideal world, or, you know, or maybe in a near future world, uh, because that transition is already here, it's already happening, um, most homes should be powered by nearby distributed renewable energy um, because, one, it's cheaper than the traditional grid I've just described because but of... But the batteries are expensive. But as I mentioned, the, the cost is coming down. And what, um, what we are looking to do, again, along with partners, is how can we accelerate that cost reduction in batteries? We're already seeing it cost competitive with unsubsidized coal, with um, uh, even gas generation. So people, had, people, again, have the impression that it's expensive. But that was 10 years ago. Battery costs are significantly coming down now. Really? It, it is indeed. It is indeed. And, um, uh, you know, I, uh, part of what we want to 
part of the effort is to make sure we're getting this message out and we're demonstrating it with proof points. So the um, International Energy Agency, the IEA, mm -hmm. just released a report on batteries um, a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, and a lot of these numbers are on there. Of course, I know not everyone is going to read an IEA report, um, <laughs> but it does show that um, the trend is downward and it's going to continue accelerating, mainly because in order to meet our 2030 um, sustainable development goals, provide access to electricity for largely 600 million people, mostly Africans that don't have access to energy, we're going to have to double the rate at which we're producing batteries. So if you think of all the batteries that have been produced, we now need to double that rate to be able to meet the goals. So that creates a huge opportunity um, for, for everyone, really, both um, along the value chain, both the manufacturers, but then the end users. So the cost of batteries is coming down. I think that's a key message. Um, yeah. Yeah, but how do we help the climate, you know, when these batteries die out eventually, how do we dispose of them in, in a safe way so that they don't affect, you know, our climate and, you know, impact on us in the end? Another excellent point, uh, because um, in the past, we failed to pay attention to the long-term effects of new technology and technology technology adoption. Um, I think one of the positives around this energy transition is there is a lot of attention being focused on that. Um, so you hear a lot of things about the circular economy, about um, second life of batteries. Um, essentially, how do we mitigate, we plan for it, right? So from the very start, as we're initiating projects, we have to be thinking about how do you decommission it in a safe manner? How do you recycle it in a safe manner. Some of that technology exists today, but as we know with technology, by the time you're getting to the end of the life of the battery, there would have been many cycles of innovation. But the key important thing is, at the starting point, you're having it at the forefront and making sure you're planning it um, into the ecosystem of what you're doing. That, that is really important, isn't it? Because uh, we can't be talking about renewable energy, and in the end, we're now talking about um, increased climate activity and, you know, Africa being the dumping ground of most of these technologies. We don't want that to happen. Uh, thank you so much, Damola, thank you. for joining us on the program today. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Cambodia has blamed factors including the heat wave gripping Southeast Asia for a deadly ammunition warehouse explosion. Twenty soldiers were killed in the incident in Kampong Spo province in Cambodia on Saturday. Rejecting claims the rebellious soldiers were to blame, officials said the blast was caused by a combination of faulty munitions and extremely hot weather. There are reports an office building as well as nearby barracks were destroyed with 25 nearby homes affected. Prime Minister Han Manet said he was deeply shocked by the blast. His promised authorities would cover funeral expenses and pay compensation of $20,000 to families of those killed while injured soldiers will get $5,000. Temperatures of up to 43 degrees Celsius are forecast for the country. The Republic of Congo is struggling to contain its biggest mpox outbreak. As scientists say, a new form of the disease has been detected in a mining town, which could spread more easily among people. And since January, Congo has reported more than 4,500 suspected mpox cases and nearly 300 deaths. Numbers that have roughly tripled from the same period last year, according to the World Health Organization. Congo recently declared the outbreak across the country a health emergency. An analysis of patients hospitalized between October and January in Kamutuga, eastern Congo, suggests recent genetic mutations in MPOX are the result of its continued transmission in humans. It's happening in a town where people have little contact with wild animals, to naturally carry the disease. The lesions reported by most patients are milder and on the genitals making the disease trickier to diagnose. In previous outbreaks in Africa, lesions were mostly seen on the chest, hands and feet. The new form also seems to have a lower death rate. At least 179 people, including 15 children, have now known to be have been killed in devastating floods 
uh, triggered by heavy rains across Kenya. The new death toll was announced on Wednesday by a government spokesperson. Heavy rains and flooding have displaced over 195,000 people, prompting the government to accommodate flood survivors in schools, establish displacement camps. Meanwhile, schools of tourists have been evacuated by helicopter in the Masai Mara National Reserve after more than a dozen hotels, lodges and camps were flooded. As heavy rains continue to batter the country, more than 14 camps were submerged early after the Talek River within the park broke its banks. Kenya's Red Cross says it has successfully evacuated over 90 people. Here in Nigeria, dialogue between female entrepreneurs and stakeholders in the micro, small and medium enterprises sector is seeking to address the challenges and opportunities faced by women in the economic landscape. Through an MSME stakeholders engagement series for women-led enterprises, as a platform is provided for women entrepreneurs to be empowered to overcome barriers and scale their businesses sustainably and connect with fellow business owners in the ecosystem. It's a stakeholder engagement series for women-led MSME enterprises focusing on building financial resilience and leveraging technology. The event is a platform for female entrepreneurs to exchange ideas and gain perspectives on overcoming economic challenges in today's business landscape. Then we'll have a capacity building program for skills. The senior special advisor to the president on entrepreneurship, innovation and digital economy says the goal is to empower women with the tools and knowledge needed to thrive in an ever-changing environment. All the, the, the critical issues that MSME, MSMEs face, it's an opportunity for us to have an inclusive engagement where we can sit down and talk about it and you can be better empowered to propel your business to the next level. So, and the good thing about strategy is that you can tailor it to your business. A panel discussion featuring esteemed female entrepreneurs gives room for the ladies to share their experiences and strategies for success. You have to make your customers emotionally attached to you. You see, we're at a time where social media is saturated. Everybody is jumping on different strategies. Because you think this person is doing it, you go to that direction. You have to be original. You have to know what works for you. You may be doing something amazing, but you are just not online. Google your name, what comes out. Google, as I'm, as I'm talking, be doing it. Google your business name, what comes out. Start from there. We are here to make it practical and real. Bike has talked about technology. Technology is so important. You can use technology to be more efficient. You can use technology to, to sell. Use technology to be more productive. And then, depending on whatever business you do, you have to look for the technology that will help your business. The gathering also gives the government an opportunity to reaffirm its commitment to supporting MSMEs particularly those led by women. As we go into states and listen to the complaints of SMEs and some, somewhat hear their struggles, we move in with some of the federal government and state government agencies who should ordinarily be responsible for the day-to-day -day running of those businesses. The MSME Stakeholders Engagement Series for Women-Led Enterprises not only allows for meaningful connections and collaborations among female entrepreneurs, it also gives room for the ladies to bear their minds on issues affecting their businesses. It's a special day for one royal kid. Talking about Princess Charlotte, who turns nine today, the Prince and Princess of Wales shared a photo of the young lady on social media just as they did a week ago for their youngest child, Prince Louis' sixth birthday. Catherine, the Princess of Wales, has often described Charlotte as feisty compared to George, the first child and one, the one in charge. Today's photo of Charlotte was taken by her mother at Windsor in the last few days. Kensington Palace issued an assurance that the picture of Louis had not been edited. And as we end the program... We hope they succeed. I'm talking about the thousands of dinosaur fans 
who were headed to Demela in Alberta, Canada, known as the dinosaur capital of the world, to attempt the, to break the world record for the largest gathering of people dressed as dinosaurs during the Jurassic Jamboree over the weekend. Participants of all ages showed up in bright and colorful inflatable dinosaur costumes gathering to be counted in the record attempt for a Cretaceous collective. They call the event a once-in-a-lifetime chance to be part of a world record and express hope at smashing the previous record of 252 people. However, Guinness World Record officials said turnout for the event was so high, it overwhelmed the organizers and an accurate count could not be made on the spot. Welcome to Drumheller for the Jurassic Jamboree. We are here today to break the world record for inflatable dinosaur costumes in one place. I think it's a really unique way to be part of our world record. I don't have any unusual skills, so this is a once in a lifetime chance. Today is our actually our 17th anniversary. We're from Airdrie. We thought a great way to celebrate it was to come be part of a Guinness Book of World Record event. I think there's enough people to beat the record. I think there must be at least 2,000 people here today. So the good news is that we have thousands of people here right now. The bad news is that there are way more people here than they anticipated. We're going to go back and review the drone footage in London and make sure we get an accurate count. Michael just said we had over 3,000 here. So, we are the dinosaur capital of the world. So, did they make it or did they not make it? You be the judge. Thanks for watching. I'm Amarachi Ivani.